So let's start our t discussion about chapter four, and we're going to be talking about properties of pure substances. So what is a pure substance? So a pure substance is something that has a fixed chemical composition throughout. So in the case, and a good example is, and an easy example to understand is nitrogen. So nitrogen is uniform throughout, so we consider that as a pure substance. But what about air? Air is a mixture of not both nitrogen and oxygen. About 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. And we can measure that either by mass or by volume, and that those values stay approximately the same. How about on the right here? We have a liquid vapor mixture of water, and we have a liquid and air mixture on part uh, of part B of this uh, example. So for the water mixture of liquid and vapor, we will consider that to be a pure substance. But a mixture of liquid and gaseous air is not. And that has to do with the different compositions of the air. Now, when air is in gaseous form, we consider it a, a pure substance. But as we begin to condense it, and we won't talk about condensing it because that's getting into cryogenics. But if we were, and it's just an example, we would not consider that to be a pure substance because as we condense it, we would have liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen uh, phases, both or basically two different types of liquids coexisting together. So that's something to think about as you're going through your problems here. Now, to make it easy, your life easy, we are only going to be dealing with pure substances. Air, water, refrigerant, we'll be dealing with pure substances. Now, those su pure substances We'll be considering multiple phases of those substances. So we'll be thinking about the gaseous phase of something, the liquid phase of something. We will not discuss, for the most part, any type of solid phase. Although, as a disclaimer, I may decide to do something with that, but I'll be sure to inform you of that um, during our class. Now I said solid, liquid, and gaseous phase. Now what do I mean by that? What are the distinctions between the three? Now in a gaseous phase, if we're, if we're able to zoom in on a, let's say water. Uh, water in the solid phase is obviously ice. As we begin to melt, maybe we increase the temperature of this ice. We begin to melt it and become a liquid. And if we zoom in on the molecules of liquid water, we'd see that the molecules would be very close together, relatively close together still, compared to its solid form, but they would move about each other. Whereas in the solid form, it would be a much more rigid type shape that they would be uh, forming. If we continue to heat it, would see that the space between the molecules would continue to increase significantly for their size and we would have large gaps by large I mean large on a molecular level between the different uh, water molecules and their interactions would or the amount of interaction they had with each other would depend on the movement of the particles in the system which may be uh, dictated by the amount of temperature in our system. So let's talk let's think about the different phases here. So we know that there can be solid, liquid or vapor phase or gaseous phase. But uh, let's let's think about it and how we characterize these, how do we measure them? How are we going to define them? and let's introduce some nomenclature. So the first bit of nomenclature here I want to talk about is I want to talk about a compressed liquid. So compressed liquid would be you getting a glass of water from the water faucet. So water sitting at 20 degrees Celsius, all right? Let's say you collect some in your glass. So let's say this uh, outer lining represents your glass. Let's say on your glass you somehow sealed your glass with a piston. 
and that piston can move um, at different levels uh, as it as it this um, fluid may occupy more volume. But as far as you're concerned, this water that you've collected in your glass, you've put this piston on top, and it's just resting on top of this incompressible water. Well, in that phase, like I said, we consider that as a compressed liquid. Or you may also hear the term subcooled liquid. Now, you can imagine getting that water, putting a torch to it or some other type of heating device, and heating that water. And you would notice that the water begins to heat and the temperature increases substantially. And let's say that water increases to 100 degrees Celsius. Well, we'd expect that that water would begin to boil and subsequently begin to vaporize. And of course, we're considering the pressure in this both of these cases to be at one atmosphere. And actually, we're going to assume pressure is constant for all the states that we have here. Now, as it begins to boil, we see that this fluid is a, and we call, a saturated liquid. So it's about to become vapor, but it hasn't quite reached it yet. Now, if you like, and just take a minute or less than a minute here to think about what would happen next. Now we keep putting this torch here, and what we observe from point one to point two is we saw that the temperature increased substantially, 80 degrees Celsius. Now state three, we would expect that the temperature increases substantially again, right? And then we begin to have vapor, but let's see what actually happens in reality. Oh, in state three, we see that temperature is constant. Now what's going on here? Why, despite us heating it and putting a lot of energy into the system, why is the temperature not increasing anymore? Well, you'll see in state three we have two phases. We have a saturated vapor and a saturated liquid coinciding. Why is the temperature the same though? Well, a lot of that energy is going to change the phase of that water from a liquid to a vapor. So that energy is going somewhere. Remember, energy is conserved, but instead of energy going to a temperature increase, energy is being converted through this, through a phase change increase. Now at this point, at stage three, we call that a saturated liquid vapor mixture. Now how much vapor do we have in this phase? How much liquid do we have? Well, we're going to have to employ, employ some other analysis in order, to, in order to determine quantitatively how much of each we have in here. But as far as we're concerned at this point, we just know that we've put a lot of energy in and we have liquid and vapor, but the temperature is the same. Now at state four, we could continue to put a lot of energy into our system. And we've done this now for a while. And at this point, we notice that the um, all the liquid now has vaporized. Now we have a now a saturated vapor. So all that liquid has been converted. Still the temperature is the same now except that all that energy has gone into vaporizing our liquid. If we continue to heat now this vapor phase, we'll see now that the energy, since it's not going to the phase change anymore, becomes now a superheated vapor. So it's no longer a saturated vapor, something that's about to condense. It's a vapor that's not about to condense. So if we were to plot this from the first state, which was just a glass of water, and as we heated it, and here I should mention on this plot we have temperature and on the x-axis we have specific volume which is meters cubed per kilogram. As we heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius we see that we enter this saturated liquid phase. All right. <clears throat> 
We continue to heat it. Temperature stays constant. So a lot of heat is coming into the system, a lot of energy. And it's not changing temperature, but it's changing from a total liquid over here up to a total vapor at this point. If we continue to add energy, remember, it turns into a superheated vapor. Now, for this process, and this is typical of how we're going to plot a lot of our things in thermodynamics, is we'll have temperature, specific volume, or we'll call it a TV diagram, and on these TV diagrams, we'll have lines of constant pressure. Now something that's interesting and something that we need to define is saturation, temperature, and pressure. So um, these properties are basically the temperature and pressure that water or some other substance may begin to boil. So by definition, or what we've been considering, is if we're at sea level and we begin to boil water, we expect it to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. What happens if we're in El Paso, where El Paso is at a higher elevation? Do you expect water to boil at a higher temperature or at a lower temperature based on this graph that we have here? Think about that. Well, what you'll see is that water will boil at a lower temperature at higher elevations. All right, And how do we know that from Table 4.1? So let's look at this. At sea level, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Let's say we are at a very high elevation um, in our atmosphere where we have our ambient pressure, instead of being 101 kilopascals, is now 12 kilopascals. Well, at that elevation, water will boil at 50 degrees Celsius, so at a much lower temperature. And we can actually lower our ambient environment to the point where water will begin to boil at room temperature. At 20 degrees Celsius, we'll see water boil if it's in this ambient pressure of 2.3 kilopascals. Likewise, if we increase the pressure, the boiling temperature of water becomes much higher. And we can use that for our advantage in applications like cooking. So if you increase, and that's what pressure cookers are, if you increase the amount of pressure to 1.55 megapascals, water will begin to boil at 200 degrees Celsius. So essentially you can get a lot hotter water in a liquid phase or right before it's going to boil here at 200 degrees Celsius. So that gives you some insight into knowing that these are dependent on each other. So we can fix one, vary the other, and uh, still obtain this same graph. Now a few things that we need to mention and a few uh, different terms that we need to talk about. So we'll see here we have the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. Now heat of fusion refers to something or the amount of energy needed to go from a solid substance to a vapor sub or I'm sorry a solid to a liquid or a liquid turning into a solid. The amount of energy needed to vaporize something, so if we're going from a liquid to a vapor, or condensing that vapor back to a liquid, we're talking about the latent heat of vaporization. Now for water, in our example, we'll see that the latent heat of vaporization is 2,256 kilojoules per kilogram. What does that mean? So if we go back to this graph here, the energy required to vaporize our water that we were talking about to go from a saturated liquid to a saturated vapor, the energy here from point 0.2 to point 
that's going to be the latent heat of vaporization. The amount of energy absorbed during vaporization and vice versa if we're talking about condensation. So like I mentioned, quite frequently we're going to be talking about using different property diagrams. We will be introducing and describing these processes if we're boiling or getting something to boil and change phase using these property diagrams. A very popular one that we'll be using is the temperature and specific volume diagram with constant pressure lines. Another very popular one we'll be using is the pressure and specific volume. So we can interchange this y-axis with either temperature or pressure and have lines of either constant pressure or constant temperature. Okay, And each one of these follow a specific format. So we may have here on the left hand side you'll see that we have a compressed liquid rising up to be a saturated liquid. All of these have a similar line. We'll have constant temperature up to a point where it becomes a saturated vapor and at this constant pressure we'll see that we have if we continue to add heat to the system a superheated vapor. Now in our next few lectures we'll be getting more into these different property diagrams and how we evaluate them.